Hey guys, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game Clash of Cultures Monumental Edition. This is the Deluxified Upgrade Edition with the base game and additional expansion and the Aztec promo pack. This is made by WizKids. It's a two to four player game, it takes roughly about two and a half hours to play, and it's for ages 14 and up. And Clash of Cultures is basically, if you've ever heard of the game Siv Meier Civilization, very similar to that game in that regard. Basically, you're going to start with a settler in a city and you'll be utilizing your actions to move your settler and explore new lands and create new cities. And with new cities comes advancements, and advancements will let you build stuff like ports and academies that will allow you to make your city grow. Growing your city will give you more resources, which you can use to then spend on units such as ships and elephants and uh, different types of infantrymen. And you'll be battling barbarians and, of course, your friends along the tabletop, as well as trying to secure your space on the board. Now, this game is not just a battle game, um, this is a game in which you can basically go along any track you want to score as many points as possible and there's a wide variety of ways to score points in the game. After you go through a number of rounds on the round track here, uh, the game will end and you'll check to see how well you did and whoever his culture or civilization has the most points at the end of the game is the winner. Let's go ahead and take a look at the basic idea of how to set it up, the basic idea of how to play because there's a lot to this game. You're gonna have to read the full rules for this one guys, I'm not going into everything, but enough so you'll get a taste of what the game is like and then we'll go ahead and have my review. Beep bop, boop boop, let's go. So setting up the game Clash of Cultures is basically the same for every number of players except for one major thing, the game board. And if you look at this handy dandy rule book, it will tell you the two player, three player, and four player setup that will show you where you need to place the land tiles. Now, each of the different uh, civilizations is going to require a certain type of starting tile, whether you're playing as me, <laughs> Julius Caesar, Caesar, as the Romans, and it's just gonna require a basic tile. They're kind of, you know, they're basic, and you'll place it down um, based on the format of the two player rules, or if you're playing as the Mayans. The Mayans actually have a very unique tile structure because the Mayans use mountains specifically. So you'll set the game board up as directed. Uh, after you've done that, you're then gonna go ahead and place your first city, a mood token to show that they're happy, and a settler. This guy is gonna be able to create you new cities. And all the rest of the tiles should be face down. It should look something like this. Go ahead and give the first player marker to the most loveliest person on the screen right now. Oh, just happens to be me. And everybody's going to get a board. This is your main board for advancements. Everyone is going to start with ore ideas and wood and gold at zero. And then their food marker is going to start at two. Everybody's going to get three advancement cubes and they'll place it next to the top right of the event area. And then everybody's going to start with farming and mining. These basically come for free. Everybody knows how to farm and mine right now. You're also going to get an action board. Are you playing the base game, which is just going to be the uh, the gray area here, which shows you just the basic uh, basics of Clash of Cultures, the original, or are you going to jump in and play with the whole big bam bogey? This is what I would go for. Play with this one um, and set that next to you. So you can see is it'll tell you your actions that you can take. It will tell you what happens during your status phase and all the unique units and city pieces. Make sure you set all your advancements markers and all of your tokens slash your characters. There's a ton of them in this game. This actually has 350 minis and place them near you somewhere. Each player is also going to be getting their uh, civilization advancement little board here, as well as three leaders. Um, and each of them is gonna have unique leaders specifically for that specific ci uh, civilization slash culture. Each player is gonna get an action card and an objective card. They're randomly drawn from these decks here. You'll have your decks here. And in fact, you're gonna have your objective deck, which is shuffled, your action deck, your wonder deck, which is uh, shuffled as well, and your event deck. They're all just shuffled and they're placed somewhere and everybody gets one objective and one action. Uh, next, you're going to get your round tracker. This is where you're going to take your actions. I'll take mine, you take yours, and we'll move it, and we'll go back and forth up until the point where the status phase hits and rinse and repeat. So just go ahead and place your status marker on one on the first round. It's on the top left-hand side. You won't miss it. And Everything else is set aside. You'll have dice, which you'll mainly be using for combat. You'll have the different wonders of the world at the time. There are eight in this one. Uh, and then you're gonna have your um, mood tokens. And I believe these ones are called your culture markers. They're the two main um, currencies that you'll be using that are not part of your main character board here. And then there's extra little tokens you can set aside that may or may not be used based on the events, as well as barbarians. Barbarians can just be left in a pool. They may or may not show up throughout the game. 
Likely they will, but we'll see how involved they get. That's basically the setup for the game. I think I pretty much explained everything, um, minus different like cultures you might choose and different starting locations. But for the most part, now you know how to set the game up. All right, playing the game Clash of Cultures. Uh, I'm not gonna give you a whole bunch of tips and tricks in this explanation video. We're just gonna go through what you can do. So as you already know, there is a round tracker. This round tracker is going to have three rounds for each of the phases. After the phase is over, you'll go to a status phase and you'll go to the next one. Each player is gonna get three actions and then pass. And once everybody has taken three actions, you will move it from this phase one round one to phase one round two. Everybody will then take three actions um, in order from the starting player, and then you'll go to the next one. And you'll do this up until the point where this hits, and you'll rinse and repeat going to the next phase, uh, then going down the rounds again, and once the tracker gets all the way to the end, that will be the end of the game. Well, let's talk about actions now. You can take three actions on your turn, and the actions are actually on your player board here. The first one is you can advance. You can advance by spending food, or if you happen to have ideas or gold, you can use those instead. Those, uh, the gold's basically a wild resource, and ideas are mainly gonna be used for the advancements. Don't quote me on that. I just know that that's mainly what I've used it for. Uh, when you use two food, you can then take one of your event advancements. You're only ever gonna take them from here unless they're instructed otherwise, the top right-hand side of your game board, and you'll put it anywhere on your board um, that you want, provided you follow some certain rules. Rule number one, you must place a marker in the top position of any of the different advancement categories. If I wanna do maritime, I have to go with fishing first, the top one, and then I can do warships, navigation, or cartography in any order after that. If I want to do warfare, I have to do tactics first. It's the one right underneath it. And then I can do any of the other ones next. And the other thing is, if I want to do, or have a, um, a religion slash government, in order to do a democracy, autocracy, or theocracy, I have to actually fulfill the advancement above, um, just above the government type. So if I want to do democracy, for instance, I have to first take education and put one in writing. Then, after writing, I can put one in philosophy. Now that I have philosophy, I can go into democracy and put it into voting. And from there on, you can select anything that you want. That's just for the governments, though. And there's a little arrow that indicates on philosophy that you have to have that in order to get democracy, which makes it nice and easy to understand. Um, and then, of course, if you have a culture, which I hope you will in this game, you're going to be placing down um, a marker advancements in these little areas here as well. These are your specific ones for your specific, um, your specific civilization. Okay, so that's how advancements work. And when you get them, they're going to let you do certain things. They might let you gain new types of units. They might allow you to gain new types of portions to your city to level it up. It might give you additional storage for certain things. Because when you start the game, you can only have two food up until the time when you get the storage advancement. Um, maybe it's going to give you more roads to help your characters move or allowing you to move your um, units that are like the, the, your military. Normally they can't move. They just position themselves. But once you give them tactics, they can once again move, um, and boats allowing you to move from one water area to the next, etc, etc. There's like just a ton, and I made a ton of stuff. I'm not going to get into it all because you're going to have to experience this game for yourself and decide what you want to try out. But that is how you advance. Now you have found city. That's easy. When your settler is on a location, you can choose to remove that settler and place the city down. It's a little guy like this. You have a certain number of them. Make sure you use them wisely. Each city can only be leveled up based on the number of cities you have. If you only have three cities, you can only advance a city up to level three. Next thing that you can do is you can activate a city. When you activate a city, oh no, leave that guy right there, then you can choose to either recruit units, collect resources, or construct a building. When you recruit units, you'll choose the city, you will then spend the resources, and also you have to have the requirements, which are also shown on your unit area, and you'll take one of those units and place it down on your city that you've selected. You can collect resources based on the level of your city, which is the main city plus any little city things around it, um, and the mood of the city. If he is happy, you're going to get plus one. Um, you will actually be able to gain resources based on the tiles that you see around it. So in this case here, plains are worth the food, uh, the mountains are going to give you ore, the forest is going to give you wood. And then there's some barren plain, the barren areas that give you nothing. So uh, I have two levels, so I can take one food and I can take one ore and I just move it up on my track here, provided I was able to do so. Uh, and that's how, that's how that works. Basically, the larger city you have, the more resources that you gain, and of course you should always Always open up the locations around your cities to give you more variety and potentially more resources at the end of the game. Um, 
And then you can go ahead and construct a building. Basically, if you have the resources required and you have the necessary advancements, you can take something like a harbor and place on your city next to water, which will open up new things for you. You can move three different units. So let's just say that, first of all, I'm left with just one settle at the beginning of the game, so I can go ahead and spend an action to move this unit here. And whenever you move a unit, you'll flip over the tile. You'll do your best to follow the rules. Check the rule book for how you need to set these up. Mainly that the fact that it all usually is based around water, so make sure that the water is somewhere on, on the edge of the board there. And then place your unit down. If, for instance, I had a bunch of units on the board, I could actually move up to three. So I could move him one space, I could move him one space, and I could move her one space. In which case, they've all now moved. I can move up to three uh, different units slash groups of units. So if I have, let's say, a multitude of, of units in an area, this would actually be considered one move to move them all in one location. Another rule about moving units is you can only have four units in one space. Um, and if you move into a unit group that is not yours, whether it be barbarians or somebody else's, they're going to fight. Don't move in with settlers, though. You're going to just lose those guys instantly. Then you can go ahead and increase happiness. Let's say that you've got a new city. Let's say that your settler, Bill, here. Where's Bill? I've lost him. There he is. Bill has uh, traveled the world and found a new location, and then you were really happy, and you spent your action, um, which is now going to let you be able to get a new city in the location. Huzzah! Well, your city needs to be happy, so in order to do that, you're going to need mood tokens, which you can place down on there when you get them in order to make your city happy. And how you do that is when you spend resources for advancements, you'll notice that some of the borders on these areas here are either yellow or blue. You can, sp you can basically gain either a mood or a um, influence here, not influence, I'm saying that wrong, culture here, based on what color you place your advancement in. So if I place mine in fishing, I'll get a mood token, which will be for me to utilize. And if I were to place my token in, where'd you go, in navigation, I would get a culture and you can use these for various things in the game and one thing is to make your areas happy it's very important to make them happy if they're sad bad stuff happens and finally i can influence culture i can use my culture tokens uh, to boost range on a successful role as well so how this works is based on the level of your city so let's say that i don't know i was at the point where i've got my harbor here and i also had this i believe this is a uh, I think it's a temple. Um, and let's just say that this was opened up as well. And let's say that the enemy had a city with, I don't know, one of these armories here next to it. Um, I have a level three, so I can actually go up to three spaces away to try and influence somebody else's. In which case, I'd be rolling these dice here, and I'd be using these as bonuses, and if I was successful, I would remove this, actually, and I'd put my own there, and that would help me gain more victory points at the end of the game. It doesn't actually control your opponents, but it kind of influences their area a bit. The city itself stays pretty much the same. And those are the main things that you can do on your turn. You can do up to three of those in any order that you'd like, as many of one as you'd like, up to three. Eventually, what's going to happen is when you remove all three of these event, um, these three advancement markers from your board here, that's going to trigger an event. You'll be placing them in like things like writing and public education and free education. And then when that happens, it's going to trigger an event. You'll draw this card and see what happens. You'll go from top to bottom and read it. Okay, it's Revolution Uprising. So then this thing tells you what to do. These events can trigger things uh, like various things like barbarians can move, barbarians can spawn. And then this text here at the bottom is going to be either just specifically for you or for everybody. Just read the card and see what it says. Most of them are not super great for you, I guess. Some of them are. And uh, some of them are pretty, pretty scary. Yeah, I mean, it just depends. Could be plague or famine or floods and all that good stuff. Then you'll take three new advancement markers and just place them back. It's kind of a little timer to dictate when events are going to happen. The last thing to talk about... Um, before I've run out of voice here, is the status phase. So after I've taken my three actions, and you have as well, we move this marker down, and we'll do that again. And then finally, after the third time, we'll advance to the uh, status phase. And this is basically like a step. It's not like a cleanup step, really, but it's a thing that happens in between each of our phases. First, we'll check did we complete any objectives. And uh, you'll look at your objectives, and you'll have like two options to complete them, whether it be a fighting one or a normal one. And if you completed it, you turn it in, and you get two points. Um, if anybody has done that, then success. You, you've completed your objectives, which you get two points for each, right? Re receive a free advancement. So you'll take one of your advancements from your um, advanced area next to the events, and you'll place it down. Huzzah. It's just useful. And then you're also going to get two draw cards. Uh, you're going to get a free action card and a free objective card, every single player. 
After that, you're going to raise a city if you'd like. You can tear one of your cities down to gain one gold resource. I don't know why you do it. I'm supp I guess there's certain reasons why. Maybe you need to move a city in a separate direction. Um, well, that's how you do it. You get to remove one city. The next is change government. You can actually pay one culture and one mood to the bank to switch your government from one thing to another. Maybe it's theocracy to autocracy or autocracy to de democracy. It's going to be up to you. And then after you do that, you'll determine the first player. And based on how many of your mood tokens that you have left over that you can utilize, basically additional resources here, is whether or not you are going to be the player who decides who the first player is. If you are, choose the first player and then begin the next round. And after that, that's basically the idea of the game. You'll continue progressing throughout the game until the end of the phases and the end of the last round, and you will check victory. You'll get one point per settlement and per building. Um, so each of your different little areas is gonna score you a point, half a point for each of the advancements on your main game board or your little uh, cultural advancement board. You'll gain two points per objective card you've successfully completed, four points for every wonder you've built, which are these guys here, which you'll find out how to get when you play the game. And you'll also um, gain additional points for maybe some event cards, as well as two points for every enemy leader you manage to defeat, which in that case are enemy leaders, which we'll talk about in my review, that you can gain and you'll be fighting other people with and hopefully not losing your guys. There you go, that's Clash of Cultures. Um, I'll explain a little bit of fighting and stuff like that in my review, but otherwise I think you've got the basic idea of this Civ-like 4X experience. So what do I think about Clash of Cultures? Well, I personally really like this game. In fact, I basically love this game. This game to me feels like the board game equivalent, the closest I've ever gotten to a Siv Meyer civilization game. It does a great job of it. It shows you the different like methods that you can take in the game. Uh, there are a few differences, obviously, as far as how the game is played and that the fact that you have to do the math yourself. Um, and some people, this is not going to be for everybody, okay? This is a game that takes a bit of time. Um, while once you understand the basic idea of the game, Take three actions of the six actions to choose from. Pass. Everybody does this. There's a round in which the status effect happens, and then we continue going, and whoever has the most points is the winner. That sounds fairly simple, but there's a lot of complexities to this game, right? You have agriculture and warfare and spirituality, economy, trading, traditions, etc., 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 and each of them requires you need one thing to get something else to then be able to build a certain thing. And so you're obviously constantly like looking at your game board. Uh, you're constantly looking at this, this board here, which is such a good help. Um, and seeing what benefits you may have gotten or may have missed if you're not careful. There is a lot of currency as well. You'll have to remember how ideas work. You'll have to remember how gold works. And then it's kind of a wild. And then you have your ore your wood and your food, which is pretty simple. And then of course you have your extra tokens here. I've never, I've never been a really good um, explainer of the different types of tokens. After doing a thousand games, they just kind of all intermix to me, but you have like your culture and, and your mood tokens and how mood affects your building. So there's just a lot that goes on. So if you're looking for a light game, then you just can just basically turn the video off now. This is not a light game. This is a very heavy game. Um, there is a lot to do, but it is very simple once you understand how to do it. I'm pretty sure I could teach pretty much anybody over the age of 14 or 15 this game and they would understand it probably about three rounds in. They would at least understand the idea of how it plays, what you can do, and the purpose. Yes, you start off with just a city, two food, and a dude. And you're like, okay, what do I do? Well, okay, well I need more food and I only have a area of two food I can get, so maybe I should get some storage. That'll increase it to seven. And as I can see on my board here, almost everything needs food, so food is probably going to be a primary resource. Okay, and I see on my board as well that wood is going to help me build other units. Um, it's also going to help me um, with when I get ore to build other different locations that will allow me to get more food, and I need food. And so you just go from there, and it's just a building block. And as you build and select your specific things you like to do, that's kind of how your gameplay is created, and you can change it every single time. The fact that you have your own different civilization with your own unique advancements is excellent, and the different characters that you can choose from when you want to advance a leader or create a leader. Your objectives are constantly what you're trying to utilize as you progress the game because they are so many points if you can collect them. Uh, some of them are more difficult than others, however. There's combat in this game. There is. Basically, how combat works without getting into how to play is my dudes go into a space where your dudes exist. That's how many dudes I have and how many years have. We play a card down, um, which is like our action cards that give us some type of bonus. We roll our dice 
and we check to see how much money, we, how much value we have. I have, I have five, you have four. Uh, we check to see if we have any other value from this board here. Oh, I have a knight and my knight has um, a bonus whenever my knight symbol is rolled, which is on a, this number specifically. That increases my number from uh, you know five to four to six to five now. Oh no, but then I have a card afterwards that I can play that increases my number up as well. And then whoever has the most, oh, uh, not whoever has the most, then, then we check our numbers and we divide them by five. So if I have 15 points at the end and you have 10, we'll divide by five. I have three out of the 15. So if I, if I divide by 15 divided by five is three, and then you've got two. So you have two hits on me and I have three on you. You would lose three units. I would lose two units, but things can change that. That's, it's basically how it works. Divide your big number by five. That's how many hits you have and you lose that, the other player loses that many units. It's actually fairly simple combat. It's pretty much used in a lot of these type of games. Um, I like combat, it works fine. It's very rarely happening though. You're not combating in this game as much as you think. You might find some barbarians along the way that you'll be defeating. Sometimes you might take over one or maybe two cities. You're not gonna be dominating everybody's city by the time this game is over though. This is more about a mixture of things that you can do. Yes, you can go on the war path and you could actually probably tear up some people's locations. It's possible and make people lose all their units to have the game end. Um, you could go the route of spirituality and trying to convert and creating temples. Or you could go the agriculture way while you're just trying to store and trade and build economy. Regardless though, whatever you wanna play, the game is always gonna end up very close, or at least most of the time, it's gonna be very close. I think the, I played this game twice, and that's enough to be able to review it, I promise you. It was like seven or eight hours, not including the rule reads and whatnot. And I got a good idea, a good sense of this game. Playing with four players is definitely the best. If you want to play with a lot of interaction, more players is gonna be better. But I really, really, really did enjoy the two-player experience as well. I love Civ games. If you love Civ games and you've never played a board game that has a Civ experience, you don't mind something that's a little heavier, this is definitely going to be for you. Quality of components, awesome. Yes, some of the miniatures might end up a little bit like their spear might be more of like a snake than a spear. Um, yes, your main game board might curl up a little bit just based on shipping and whatnot. You can kind of twist it down. It's not a huge deal. Like any of the little qualms I have about this stuff, I don't honestly really care that much about it, but some people might. So I'm listing them. Artwork for the game is excellent. All the different leaders are really beautiful. The landscape is very easy to tell the difference between them and the fact that they're always going to be ever changing is awesome. Your really cool little wonders are awesome as well. If you ever get to play one, that is. Um, yeah, I really like all the component quality. I like I have no issues with pretty much any of this stuff. It works perfectly. This feels like a Civ game. All the dice are really nice and etched. Um, like I said, it's mainly gonna just come down to that. Do you like Civ games? Do you not mind a thicker game? Do you not mind a game that's gonna have a little bit of everything, but you can't do one of one thing as much as you'd probably like? And the game will probably end before you complete doing like your list of six things that you want to do. That's just how it goes. But regardless, Clash of Cultures, the monumental edition is Excellent. I've never played the base game before. I went straight into the heavy mode because that's what I like. I love the different options. I love the different leaders you can select, which are just basically another unit. You can choose one. You can gain one of these guys here. Uh, they have a unique ability on them. Some of them are really good. Some of them are pretty good. Some of them just involve like giving you bonuses and whatnot. And if you lose them, you're gonna lose points. So I, I said I'd mention that. Um, they work well. I'm just afraid to play them sometimes because I don't want to lose points, but they are really good. Anyway, that's pretty much all I got for Clash of Cultures. This is an excellent Civ game. I'm keeping this in my collection for a very long time. It probably won't see the table very often because of the requirements that it, it in details with the amount of players. Um, and some people would want more interaction and this game doesn't give as much, I would imagine, as far as combat goes. And my writer obviously kind of like, he liked the game, but it was also not like his cup of tea because he wanted more interaction and more fighting and that kind of stuff. And it just doesn't have that. This is kind of a, a Civ game where it's just a little bit of everything. Anyway, guys, that's enough of me rambling. Thank you guys so much. Let's hit the outro. Thank you guys for watching the Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game Clash of Cultures. If you're interested in taking a look at this game, there's a link down below in the description. If you've seen more than one of our videos here and you would like, you can go ahead and hit that subscribe button if you think we've earned it, as well as the bell notification button as well. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching and it's really hot in here. So I look forward to seeing you guys next time.